We're delighted to welcome you to the 37th Annual University Faculty Lecture. Uh, this is an extraordinarily distinguished lecture series that has been uh, going on annually at the university, uh, given by a faculty member who is chosen by his or her peers. And it is a recognition of significant contributions uh, to the respective academic disciplines. Uh, contributions that have uh, not only resonance throughout the university, but indeed have uh, become a significant part of the national dialogue. Uh, it's the highest recognition that the faculty can bestow on someone in their own ranks. And the roster has included artists, musicians, uh, historians, scientists, engineers, uh, some of them Nobel laureates as well. It has been a remarkable group, and we are delighted to welcome into that group tonight uh, Professor Batya Friedman, uh, who is eminently deserving of the recognition that this lecture bestows upon her. Um, she's really a true pioneer in the area of designing technology that supports uh, profound, important human values, those that endure. Uh, she's been a faculty member at, at our information school since 1999, uh, as well as an adjunct professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, as well as the Department of Human-Centered Design and Engineering. Uh, so she spends an enormous amount of time doing research and the rest of her time in faculty meetings. Um, <laughs> but she's also director of the Value-Sensitive Design Research Lab, which studies values like well-being, dignity, justice, uh, welfare, and human rights. Uh, her research at the University of Washington is extraordinary and complex. Uh, she's currently working on a multi-lifespan information uh, system design, a program that really studies solutions to problems that are unlikely to be solved in the uh, lifespan of one person. Uh, and you can imagine how many problems we encounter uh, in our society that really extend uh, well beyond the life of any individual researcher. Uh, she's also investigating methods for what she calls envisioning, uh, imagining new ideas that use information and technology uh, to shape our future. Uh, tonight, Professor Friedman will speak to us about technology design, human values, and the future. And uh, one of the questions that seems to be on the table is how can we design tools and technology so they're more likely to support the actions, relationships, institutions, and experiences that humans genuinely care about? Uh, not always an issue that uh, is at the forefront of those who are central to the technology development, uh, but one that has to be central to us as we think about the way in which technology shapes our future and we shape technology and its future. So along with you, I am very excited to hear this uh, lecture tonight, and please join me in welcoming the university faculty lecturer, Professor Batya Friedman. Well, thank you all. I am um, truly honored to be um, recognized in this way and to be here with you all. It's um, really a remarkable, remarkable feeling and beyond words a bit to express. Um, so I'm quite humbled by that. And I wish to. Um, to dedicate this talk to um, Harry Bruce, who um, is the dean at the Information School. He's um, recovering from a car accident. And so for me, I'm going to be um, picturing Harry right here in front of me, his usual dapper self. Um, I'd also like to dedicate this talk to my daughter Zoe, who's a gem, and to all of the other young people across the globe and those who are yet to come. So, when you put a talk like this together, um, you think, whoa, what am I going to say to all of you? Um, and it could be any number of things. It could be, here's a recent piece of work and some of the important implications. It could be, here's an overview of key discoveries from a lifetime. Um, this is what I'm going for. Here's an important an idea to think about. Here's how my research fits into that idea. And then here are some pretty radical thoughts I've been having recently. And we're going to try and do all of that in about 50 minutes. So what's the important idea? The important idea is that technology has values, that design matters, and futures are at stake. So I'm going to introduce the idea. 
I'll spend a little bit of time sharing with you a few projects that I've worked on, two very quickly and one with a little bit more depth. And then I'm going to end with what I hope are some provocative ideas that you'll take away from this lecture and think about and engage with yourself. So um, to begin, being human, part of being human is to engage in tool use. It's a fundamental part of the human condition. Our tools shape how we interact with and experience the world, and those in turn lead to new tools. In the words of Winograd and Flores, in designing tools, we are designing ways of being. So not simply things that we use, but things that actually shape the way in which we experience and live our lives. So this is one of my favorite tools. Um, it's good for turning screws. Uh, it's a lever. And it's something I also, sometimes in the spring, go out in the garden, especially when I'm digging up bulbs. But it's not so good for ladling soup. <laughs> so too with our digital tools. So if you take online calendars or Facebook, those are good for awareness and building community, but not so good for things like privacy. Technology features and the features we build into them shape interaction, and those in turn shape human experience. They enable for us the things that are easy to do. They can hinder certain things. That is, they can make things hard to do but are doable. And they can prevent things. They can make things that are impossible. So the question before us, the question that I've been engaged with, is how do we go about designing these tools and infrastructure so that they are more likely to support the actions and relationships, the experiences that human beings care deeply about. And that's the question that I've been engaging with for the past 25 years. Now, I haven't been doing this work alone. <laughs> what you see here are the names of the very many people who've been engaged with me in trying to explore these questions. And I would especially recognize Alan Vorning, Dave Hendry, and Lisa Nathan, who've been working hard on these issues alongside of me. When you um, think about human values, when you think about the things that people care deeply about, I've engaged with a wide range of those. Um, and here are some that you can see, like the strings in a spider web. If you pick up one value, what you quickly see is that it is interconnected to others. So for example, if we touch privacy, it often sits in balance in some delicate way with security and with trust. Or if we pick up something like peace, that sits in a delicate balance with respect and with dignity. So all of these values work in a delicate tension together, and we must engage with them in that way. In doing my work, I've worked across a range of technologies and this montage shows you what some of them are. Um, there have been robotics, location aware systems, large scale urban simulation, telepresence, a whole range with which we've thought about the problems and developed theory and methods. So in doing this work, we've also intentionally engaged across a level of human experience. And as this slide shows you, We've worked from the individual through small groups and organizations, through public spaces and social policy, and then on the global level. And so I'd like to now touch very briefly on two projects, and then one with a little bit more depth. So the first project is at the individual level. And what could be more personal than something that you place inside your body, an implantable cardiac device? So I'd like to just mention briefly some work with Yoshi Kono, Alan Borning, and Tammy Denning. And here's the general idea. So these implantable cardiac devices now are wireless. And because they're wireless, they're now also hackable. So we've been looking at um, early security solutions to those problems. So the idea here is, can we get on the front end? And can we influence the direction of security solutions before they're well formed? with the idea that we could help the security community 
to provide solutions that will be um, amenable or acceptable to the patients who are going to live with these devices. And what you see on the screen here is one kind of solution that has been considered. That's the notion of a tattoo in which a password is tattooed onto a person's skin. And our research shows that from a patient perspective, a tattoo-like solution is often not desired, either for cultural reasons or perhaps historical perspectives. And so with work like this, we're able to speak to the security community and encourage that they look for solutions other than the tattoo-like prototype. And in fact, we're able to give some direction as to some more um, comfortable solutions from the patient perspective. And so that's one example of a kind of work that we can do where we take the things that matter to people and use that to foreground the design of technical solutions. And here's a project um, at the level of public space. This is work with Peter Kahn, Brian Gill, and others. And at the left, you see an example of an inside office. This is an unusual inside office because instead of a real window, well, it's an inside office, so it doesn't have a real window. But what it does have is a large display that shows the local outdoor scene. And with a large display, with a local outdoor scene, what it would show are people who are walking through that scene. And in fact, what you see here, since we did this work on the university campus, is the fountain area. And people walking through the fountain area, their images were captured and shown on this large display. Now, because when we do our research, we're focused not only on the people in the inside office, but on what we call the indirect stakeholders, the people who are also affected by a technology, even if they never touch the technology themselves, that led us to investigate this technology from the perspective of those people who are walking through the scene, whose images were captured without their knowing. At the time we did this work, no one was looking at what we call indirect stakeholders or their perspectives. And what our findings showed was that, in fact, women were far more uncomfortable with this technology than men, those women who were walking through the scene whose images were captured. And that finding was replicated when we did this work in Sweden. So this is an example, again, of how one can foreground the values of people who are affected by a technology in the design of the technology and then use that to um, think about what kinds of policies one would have about the use of technology. Now what I'd like to do is shift to the global level and spend a little bit more time here on this project. Um, these are complex issues. So I'd like to talk about a project that is dealing with international justice. It's a project that's tied to the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. That tribunal was established in 1994 following the genocide in Rwanda. And there are many stories that one could tell about this project. So here is one. If you have the best system of justice in the world and the people who are harmed don't know about it, it's almost as if there was no justice. So we see from that that there is a very important role for information systems if justice is to be realized. Here's another story. We're at the very beginnings of developing systems of international justice. In the same way in which we might like to know what Jefferson was thinking with the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights, we'd also like to know what are the people who are inventing right now systems of international justice thinking about, struggling with, what challenges are they facing, what hard decisions are they making as they go about inventing those systems of justice. And a third story, which is the way in which I personally came to this project, is through multi-lifespan information system design. But I will save that telling for another time. In 2008, my colleagues and I conducted 49 video interviews with personnel from the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda about their experiences and reflections. Our purpose here was to give them an opportunity to share their experiences and their reflections with the people in Rwanda, with the international justice community, 
and with the general public, not only now, but 50 or 100 years from now. So let's hear what they have to say in their own voices. We are privileged. We are privileged people for having been called to participate in the administration of international justice. In Africa now, even leaders who violate human rights, they talk in the language of human rights. Hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives, and those people have never had the opportunity to be heard. So we ought to be their voice, we have to talk for them. She had courage to testify. There are many survivors. From the judges down to the cleaners, each of us is only an element of a chain. Each of us has an important role to play. So as I mentioned, in 2008, my colleagues and I conducted 49 interviews with personnel from the tribunal, with judges, prosecutors, defense counsel, interpreters, the warden. This is work with Lisa Nathan and Bob and Betty Utter, Mel Cardin Gray, Millie Lake, Daisy Yu, and many others. So let me give you a sense of the context um, for this collection by showing you a sample clip. Um, this is a clip with Mr. Roland Amasuga. He is a spokesperson for the tribunal. He was also someone who was called in by the United Nations prior to the tribunal to help establish the fact that a tribunal might be needed. In this particular clip, he's telling the story of a witness at the tribunal. And when I play this clip for you, what I'd like you to do is think for yourself, what is the message of this clip? And who, if anyone, do you think should see it? So what is the message of this clip? And who, if anyone, do you think should see it? Being a chief of witness protection, the first time I cried in this court was the day I brought in an old lady, 85 years old lady, whose kids were all killed, husband killed, and she was raped. And I brought her in court here to testify in the first case. And this lady, I did not speak Kiyabranda. Uh, I used interpreter. We developed a kind of special relationship. She was so funny. You will never, you will never believe what she went through. And when she entered the courtroom, we prepare her when she entered the courtroom. She, she was smiling. And then when they ask her, witness, could you identify the accused person? The old mama stood up, walked, went to see the prosecutor's face. They were all white. Look at them. Look at one of the few blacks in the team of the prosecutor. She moves away, she looks at the court reporter, she moves away, she looks at the judges, she moves away, she looks at the registry members, she moves away, she looks at the defense counsel, she moves away, she looks at the accused person, she moves away. And when she came again to see the accused person, she bowed to the accused person. And she went back and sit and said, where is the accused person? He's there. Who? Who are you talking about? He's there. The judges say, can you point the finger? Say, in my culture, you don't point the finger to powerful people. <laughs> say, no. He was the mayor, and the mayor was the most powerful. And the court agreed to agree that the lady has recognized the accused person on the basis of that sign. And then when we went home, they said, Mama, how do you feel? I'm so happy. I could not believe that I'll have this day in my life to see the Son of God to be there with handcuff. No, it's not possible. I can die today and go and see my kids and report back to them that justice has been done. 
So I'd like you to think to yourself for a minute, what is the message of that clip where Mr. Amasuga is talking? If you were to tell somebody what that was about and why it was important, and who would you think should see that clip, if anyone? So that's the question that we asked Rwandan adults and youth um, this spring when I took a team to Rwanda investigating the relevance of this information design for a group of Rwandans. And I'd like to share with you what some of them said. So here are what some of the adults said. They said, an important person, even when he is in trouble, he is still, he stays as that important person and he deserves his respect. And who should watch this? I think other people who are 50, they should watch this video and take an example for this. This woman should be a model for them to see what they should be courageous and be able to follow. So we see for these adults that when they see this clip and when they hear the story of this woman, they see a message of respect and courage. They see a person who is able to hold on to the um, values of deference and hierarchy within the Rwandan society, um, as well as to stand up and recognize um, that there has been some misdoing. When we showed that same clip to Rwandan youth, here's what the youth said. The message, what Amizuka said, is that you should not be afraid. This old woman was afraid that she was scared that she couldn't point her finger to the accused. And then another youth said, this old woman does not have self-confidence in her, like she was undermining herself, that she couldn't even point a finger to the accused. You should have self-confidence. And who should watch? The category of people who should watch this video is the people who did not get the chance to go to school because those people who are ignorant, they sometimes accept to respect even authorities who are encouraging them to do evil things. So that category of people should watch this video. The same video clip, a message of what not to do. The same person acting in the same way and viewed by one group of people, the adults, as acting in a courageous way and showing an appropriate deference to authority. And then with Rwandan youth, that same person viewed as demonstrating what not to do, and that that is not the way to resist authorities. So what we see reflected in these clips and in what people are saying is the beginning of generational difference in response to an understanding of the clips and what has happened in their lives. And part of what we're doing with this project is trying to understand how the very information system itself needs to adapt and adjust as a society moves forward and as a society heals from something like a genocide. And I think part of what you see reflected in the comments of the adults and of the youth is a shift within Rwandan society such that the young people are being educated to understand when to resist authority. And you can see that coming out in how they interpret this clip. Now likely, you had your own interpretation of this clip, and it might have been different from either that of what we encountered with the Rwandan adults or with our group of Rwandan youth. And likely persons who are involved with international justice, when they see this clip, might think that there's a message there about cultural sensitivity in the courts. So I'd like to show you now very briefly the system that we've built. All the videos in the system are um, on the web, released under a Creative Commons license, and this is to support access and reuse. So going very briefly to the system, um, the website that you see here is live. This is a live system. We can go look at all 48 interviews. They're right here. And in fact, 
Here's the entry for Mr. Amasuga, and you can see right here in a witness to the court, that's the very clip that I shared with you. If I want to, I can look at several of the clips that have been called out, or I can watch the entire interview broken down part by part. And if I look, for example, at a part of the interview, I'll see that there are two interesting features. These are public, online public curation features. In other words, rather than a very elite group of people, expert people, determining what the content or meaning of any of these clips might be, we have opened this up to the public. So you can go ahead and watch as much of an interview as you'd like here, and then what we invite you to do is help us index the clip. And if you index the clip, you can choose your language. Can your Rwanda, the national language of Rwanda, English or French? You can um, enter the words that come to mind. And then if you tell us a little bit about yourself, if you're perhaps a Rwandan born before the genocide or a Rwandan born after, or if you're a legal specialist, or maybe you're an educator, or someone who just has general interest, then as more and more people use the system, we will eventually be able to display for any particular clip the messages that different communities of people find within that clip. So that no one group's meanings take precedence or are privileged over another group's. And also, if you see something in a clip that you think is really important, that you think should be salient for other people, you can suggest a highlight. So you would just tell us where the highlight begins in that section. You would tell us why you think it's important. And you can give us your name if you would like to. And if you have done that, then you click the Submit Your Highlight button. It goes off to the team. And in about a week, you'll see your highlight show up on the website. So if we go back here to Mr. Roland Amasuga, there's a highlight here called The Psychology of Fear. That was submitted by someone in the world. They chose to be anonymous, so we don't know who. But someone watched that clip and felt there was something important about dealing with the psychology of fear and contributed it. And it is now a part of the site and a part of the curation, the online public curation for the site. So in this way, we're trying to create tools that allow the, the globe to have a say in how these materials that in some ways belong to everyone on the globe should be understood and should be accessed. So what I've been doing so far at this point, I hope I've convinced you that technology has values that design matters. And now what I'd like to do is think a little bit about the future. What I've shared with you thus far is work that we've already done. So work where we have some understanding about how to go forward there, how to make progress. What I'd like to do now is share with you some things that I've been thinking about listening to. In some ways, this is going out on a limb kind of risky business to talk about things that you don't really know what's going to be happening there. But on the other hand, I think it's very interesting business. Um, it's the place where I think that there are provocative ideas and places where I hope that you will leave um, the talk tonight and continue to have conversations among yourselves, not just now, but probably over the next decade. So what I'd like to do is talk about four futures um, represented by the four images on this slide. So the first Im image is that of a flock of birds. And the idea that I'd like to talk about is communal intelligence. So the idea of communal intelligence is simply the idea that instead of um, thoughts, long thoughts, being residing within a single person, is that somehow communally we think together. So each person thinks a small fragment, and somehow out of that collectivity a solution emerges. There's no one person that thought it. That's the really important bit. 
And we're talking here fundamentally not only about thought, but also about action. So let me give you an example from some work that Ken Goldberg did at UC Berkeley um, nearly a decade ago. He ran a very interesting experiment called the Demonstrate Project. And in that project, he put a camera um, on the campus, pointed down to a plaza, not unlike where we have our fountain area. But he also hooked his camera up to the web, had a very simple interface, and anybody could go online and they could indicate where they wanted the camera to point. And then somehow his system would take all of that input with some set of algorithms that he'd made up and it would determine how to move the camera. So no one person was determining where the camera moved. Everybody had some contribution to it and some action was being taken. And in that case, in that situation, it was a time when there were a lot of young men who were on the web and a lot of those young men were interested in looking at young women. So when that, you looked at where the camera pointed, it was often pointing at young women. But the question arises in a situation like that, whose action is it? And who's accountable or responsible for that action? And imagine this. Maybe we're not just talking about moving cameras around anymore. What if we're talking about performing surgery? Or what if we're talking about directing missiles? Or any other kind of activity in which there is a fragmentation of individual contribution to what a thought is and to what an action is, and then we engage in communal or collective action. So what I want to put on the table for you is that with the technologies we have, we really do have opportunities to explore and engage and live in a world in which at least some portion of our thoughts and actions are, are of this communal flavor. And the second idea I want to share with you has to do with the human mind. That's represented by the image here of many, very beautiful image, of um, different brains. So think about this. We know the human brain develops after birth. We know the physical environment and stimulus affects that development. So imagine a child who experiences lots of small fragments of information and interaction. And we're already seeing that in our world today with the way in which um, video and TV is cut up into small segments, um, texts, tweets, all kinds of ways in which in our interactions and in our exchanges, information is becoming increasingly fragmented. So how will that accumulation of interactions with fragments of information affect brain development. That mind, that mind that grows up around small, small fragments of information might be quite facile at processing small bits of information, but perhaps less skillful at more sustained thought. That brain might be particularly well suited for that sort of communal intelligence I was just talking about, but that brain might not be as well suited for long extended discussions, um, writing long essays, um, engaging in long sustained series of thought. Now what does that mean for the health and well-being of society? I don't know. Maybe because for the most part we're sitting here with our minds that tend to think in longer ways we're actually limited by that. We're limited by our single minds. Maybe there's a way in which if we become good at processing small fragments of information but can come together in some kind of communal intelligence that there will be new opportunities for solving problems and addressing issues, things that we haven't seen before. Or maybe we're at risk at losing something really important, the ability to have some kind of sustained thought to follow logical argument, 
um, to understand where fallacies enter into discussions. What I do know is that in some curious ways, we're doing a grand societal experiment with this. Um, and we will be living with what those consequences are, one way or the other. So I think for us, um, the issue is to be alert, aware, and to pay attention to these things. And it is a place where we will need a great deal of research and investigation and exploration to understand what the implications might be, and then at some point perhaps to be in a position to make some decisions about how one would like society to go forward. The third future I'd like to talk about <clears throat> is the data cloud. So there's much talk these days about the data cloud, <clears throat> and here I'd like to make just a few observations. We're putting more and more of our critical information into the cloud. Health information, financial information, education, personal things. There's probably military information there, but I'm not privy to that. And if we're honest, <clears throat> we can't secure that cloud. And if we're honest, we can't delete or remove information from that cloud. So my question to you is, how wise is this? <laughs> so I'd like to draw an analogy. <clears throat> I'm reminded of discussions that I had in the late 70s and early 80s um, with nuclear engineers when I was a student at Berkeley. And this is how those conversations would go. At that point, we could build a nuclear power plant, and then there would be the question of nuclear waste. And they would say, well, by the time we've generated it, we will have figured out how to solve it. <laughs> well, <laughs> with respect to the data cloud, given these circumstances, that we do not know how to secure it, that we do not know how to delete data from it. What is responsible innovation? So I promised you I was leaving you with provocative questions, no answers. I don't know the answer to this as well. However, I think we really need to engage with the question. And we need to engage with it in as simple a way as I have stated it here. Because I think too often we obscure those questions by getting into technical details when there are some really fundamental issues that need to be addressed. And then the last image that you see is that of the planet Earth. So, I know I don't need to tell you how many people are on the planet. There's a lot. <laughs> and I know I don't need to tell you how many digital devices people have. Um, there are estimates at five or more per person so we're looking at five times a lot. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk about new research for reinventing the internet. So there's a lot of work being done right now um, to actually reinvent the internet, to come up with the next generation of what that technology will be. And <clears throat> of all of the um, enterprises in this direction that I'm aware of, all of them, in one way or another, are assuming as a model that the internet is going to be accessible to most people on the globe and that it's going to be accessible to them through multiple devices. So the underlying assumption is that we're going to have an internet, we're going to have all these people, and each of these pe persons is going to have many of these devices in order to access all of that information that, as I just mentioned with the cloud, we're all putting there. So I want to talk about scale. The planet is a limited physical resource. Unless these devices somehow require far fewer physical materials, these models don't scale. What we need to be doing is imagining the internet differently. We need to come up with a way to think about what the internet offers us in a way that really makes sense for the number of people who are on the planet and that really takes seriously access for those numbers of people. And by take seriously, I don't mean that those who are working <coughs> on re-envisioning the internet are not seriously thinking about 
these issues of scale and that they don't also care about access, but that we have a very serious problem with the nature of the planet and physical resources. And unless we really are thinking of jumping off this planet to some other astral body, then we need to um, use those limitations as design constraints to guide our design so that as we reinvent these solutions, we do so within the constraints of what the planet offers. So at this point, I hope I have um, shared with you four provocative ideas, things to think about and think with, talk with your friends and family about, <clears throat> um, ponder. They're not things that will have easy solutions. They're all complex problems. Um, but I hope that there are ways in which you will begin to engage with and think about where the technology is going. I hope that I've left you with the feeling that um, we design our technologies, our technologies have values, that design matters, and that our futures are at stake. So I leave you with one last <clears throat> word, and that is our goal should be progress, not perfection. In all of these things I've been talking about, the challenges are so hard, so difficult, that to ask for right answers or ideal answers from ourselves would leave us paralyzed. I hope what the first part of the talk has done is showed you <clears throat> that we have the can to make progress. We have the can to move forward in good ways that foreground our human values in the design process and that we can shape technology in ways that will be supportive of the things that are important to people that we care most deeply about. And that even as we do so, we may make mistakes. There may be many things that we don't understand. And so we need to remain alert so that we can make progress and we should not hold ourselves accountable to perfection for that will stop us from going forward. And on that, I would like to thank you and invite you to join in conversation. Thank you. So I'd be happy to take questions or conversation. We have a little bit of time. <laughs> That's a, a great question. So the question was, um, with respect to communal intelligence, could I compare or contrast that to a mob mentality? <laughs> it's a really great question. Um, I don't know that I have an easy answer to that. I suppose we could say that when communal intelligence goes awry, it's like a mob mentality. Um, and I think what's interesting is one could be when that becomes the norm. The mob mentality is hopefully not the norm. But, when, but if that kind of thinking and way of being becomes something that we engage in all the time, that could be a fundamentally different change for society. Um, so that might be one one kind of difference. Um, <clears throat> and then I think perhaps also using that as a way, also for our positive ends, as a way in which we engage with things might be a difference. That's a very nice question. Thank you. Please. I'm not sure I can make this a question, but let me give you a context and get your responses. We, we think of people as uh, rational, but we know they're emotional. We have doctors and nurses doing different functions. We have mothering and fathering. Is there an emotional component? Much of our use of technology is entertainment. We feel good about what's happening. From a value system perspective, or from any of the work you've done, can you just respond to that broad topic? So it's the, the topic emotion and what, what can we do with our information design to support emotion or people's experience of emotion? If I'm going to talk to you, if I'm going to lecture to you, I want you to feel good. There's process motivation. Let's have fun together rather than just look at outcome motivations. Are your process motivations, is that part of your research or is that something you're working with as well? 
So I'm still not sure I understand the question, but I would say that emotion is a really big part of the work that we've done. If you look at the um, voices from the Rwanda Tribunal Project, and um, I mean, these are not so much the happy emotions that you see in the stories that people are telling from the tribunal, but there's a tremendous amount of emotion there. And people have been taking these clips, for example, and using them with um, some recent victims of sexual violence. Uh, they've been used, um, for example, in the Congo, and used as a way to give people permission to talk about some of the things that they've experienced. So as a way, as a therapeutic kind of um, way of working. They've also been, um, people have also thought about using some of these clips with police um, as a way to sensitize them to working with um, victims of sexual violence. So those are ways in which these kinds of materials can address emotion. Um, I'm not sure I've exactly addressed your question, but that perhaps addresses some of it. Yes. Uh, so it feels awfully specific, but with regards to the Voices of Rwanda project, where you find that one of the main differences between adults and the youth in Rwanda is the perception of tradition versus fear. Um, I wonder about the link that says a psychology of fear and whether that introduces any element of bias in those looking at, at the links, especially if the, if the goal is to collect uh, the interpretations of different groups. So, um, so that's a great question. There's sort of many things to say about that. First, one thing I would want to clarify is that we have done workshops um, in Rwanda with three different groups of adults and three different groups of youth. And so one wants to be a little cautious about generalizing to all adults and all youth. But, and I'm sharing with you just a small bit from those, those workshops. Um, and then there's another question, another complexity that has to do with um, speech and freedom of expression. So right now in Rwanda, there is um, a 2008 genocide ideology law which limits expression around the genocide. There are certain kinds of things that um, carry severe consequences if you say that. When we first went to Rwanda with this project in 2009, we wanted to build a small discussion forum around the project that would actually be used in a local area network. So not on the internet, just in a local ne area network. And our Rwandan colleagues um, didn't feel comfortable with that because if one person came and put one statement into that um, discussion forum that violated the law, it could put um, not only the system, our system at risk, but their entire organization at risk. And so what we've tried to think about is how can you have speech, how can you have safe speech within those um, constraints? And that's actually what led us to develop the online public curation tools. So for example, the way in which you speak in this system, since all of the interviews are not censored, is by finding something that somebody has said in the collection that you think is important for other people to hear. And then within this constrained environment, the way in which you speak is by finding that information and making it more salient through a highlight. So for someone, the psychology of fear as a topic was important, and then they brought that to the fore. Uh, thank you for speaking about these things. I was wondering if you if you think that human values are a constant? Well, that's a very deep question. <laughs> um, so I think, and I think it's also very much tied to who we are and our minds and how they're situated in our human bodies and if our bodies changed in significant ways, maybe the things we cared about deeply would change. So for example, if our bodies changed such that we didn't experience physical pain, then that might change things a lot. So I think that at, um, at one level, if one goes deep enough to those notions of mind and body, that there are some bases for which we can form notions of human dignity. And then very rapidly as you go from there, 
then you, um, there are all kinds of cultural overlays as to how those are experienced by people. May I ask a follow-up question? Yep, yeah, please. Um, in that case, what's the danger of, is there a danger of designing ourselves into a position where we don't change our values? So I think that the question perhaps that you're asking is, um, will there be a reification with these information systems? And also, what about this process of adaptation? So the work um, that the Voices from the Rwanda Tribunal Project comes from is from a theoretical framing on something called multi-lifespan information system design. And what we're trying to do there is think about problems, significant societal problems that we're unlikely to solve within a single human lifespan and ask ourselves what are the roles and opportunities for information systems to help support those solutions as they unfold. And once one engages with that, one of the key things that those information systems are going to have to do is adapt over time, right? Because the technologies will change, the socio-political context will change, we hope we're moving towards a solution. So if that's the case, then things will also need to change so that those solutions unfold, the information systems go with them. In the case of the voices from the Rwanda Tribunal Project, and actually for many of these um, projects that are dealing in post-conflict situations, there's a question of how salient this information should be as societies move forward. Right? So a fear with a system like this might be that it would continue to pull people back into the conflict. And so one of the things that we'll want to do is we want to preserve this information against revisionist history. We want to keep it accessible for people who will want to explore for a variety of reasons. It could be research and history. It could be personal family issues. but. Over time, as the society heals and moves forward, the saliency of this kind of a collection probably will need to be toned down. Otherwise, it can play a role, perhaps, in you know, bringing those um, conflicts back up to the, to the fore. And so those are part of the design challenges of doing this work. So it's core to what this research program is about. Thank you. Um, this is in regards to your uh, statements about communal intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of grew up in a world of social networking and Facebook, and uh, there's a phenom phenomenon known as uh, Facebook stalking. <laughs> um, and I was just kind of wondering, what are your thoughts on maybe like Twitter and Facebook and all these social networking sites in regards to a kind of, a kind of voyeurism, um, but also a kind of um, wanting to be seen and heard? Wow. Well, hmm. Sorry, hmm. if that didn't make any sense. No, <laughs> it makes lots of sense. Um, you know, one thing that is, you know, interesting, I think it goes back to um, the gentleman's question about, you know, what, are there some very deep values, aspects of human beings that don't change? I mean, you know, I think at some level, all people want some kind of recognition, some idea some identification. We all have a construction of identity, um, these kinds of things. And then the ways in which we do those, I think, can be carried out in a whole diversity of ways. And societies choose different ways in which those um, can happen. You know, in some societies, it, it might be what kind of clothing you wear. And in other societies, everyone will wear the same clothing, you know, the same color of clothing. So, some of those things are playing out in this environment. Um, and I think that that's part of, what, part of what you're seeing. My comments about the communal intelligence had to do a bit more with the fragmentation of the information. Um, if the people you know are largely by the fact that they know someone else who knows someone else who knows someone else, maybe that's a way in which it's a more fragmented knowing of someone than a whole or robust knowing of what a person might be about or the nature of the encounter. Um, but again, some of these things remain to be seen. So it's a little hard to, to know in advance as much as just to keep one eye, one's eyes open to what the possibilities might be. Thank you. Dr. Friedman, <clears throat> let us again thank you very much for an extraordinarily stimulating and interesting lecture. 
Uh, please join me in thanking Professor Friedman.